When we think of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we tend to think of, well, Russia crossing the border into Ukraine. But that sentence is a little imprecise. Yes, Russia's official armed forces crossed the border. But Russia's military presence is actually fragmented. Not in the sense that they are fighting each other, though intra-Russian conflict may be happening, more on that later, but rather that Russian forces are not one cohesive organization. Given Russia's poor management of the war, this might not sound surprising. However, there is some level of intentionality that underlies this fragmentation, which raises questions of why Putin has developed such a system. In fact, given the circumstances, there are good reasons to do this. Today, we will discuss five of them. Mobilization, casualty sensitivity, plausible deniability, coup proofing, and internal competition. And as we go, we will talk about the consequences of fragmentation on the war's outlook. The bottom line is that fragmentation is not ideal for the Kremlin, but it might be better than the alternatives that Putin has available. In any case, we need to begin with background by discussing how exactly the Russian military is divided. As a starting point, you obviously have the traditional military. The army has been the main player in the war so far, but the navy has held Ukraine under blockade, and Russian airborne forces are present, though not nearly as big of a factor as analysts predicted at the start of the war. But beyond that, there is also the Wagner Group. They're the most famous of the private military companies, or PMCs, involved in the conflict. They are known in the West as the entity primarily responsible for the Battle of Bakhmut. Next, you have Patriot, likely Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu's personal PMC. There is another PMC called ENOT, a Russian acronym for the United People's Communist Partnerships, except ENOT as a word in Russian means raccoon, and trash pandas are feisty yet adorable, so the PMC adopted it and thus this video will also go with that imagery. Even Gazprom, Russia's main energy company, runs a PMC involved in the war. Outside of the business sphere, we can't forget about the armed forces of the Luhansk People's Republic, which within it runs the Ghost Brigade, which attracts many foreign fighters. And to match Luhansk, we also have the armed forces of the Donetsk People's Republic. These two people's republics are complicated. Way back in 2014, they were originally bankrolled by Russia, with the goal of causing chaos in the eastern portions of Ukraine as breakaway regions. However, no other country recognized them until 2022, and to push the number past three, you have to go to other non-recognized state-like political entities deeply affiliated with Russia. In sum, Luhansk and Donetsk would not have amounted to much of anything without Russia signing this paperwork to intervene. The Kremlin mobilized these polities at the start of the 2022 invasion, and then annexed them, at least by the Russian law signed here, on September 30th of that year. Nevertheless, their militaries remained independent, at least for a while. That nominally changed on February 19th, 2023, with an integration order, except they still remained at least partially distinct. Going back to the broader theme, this should not be surprising. Within Russia's traditional political subdivisions, Chechen battalions led by its regional governor, Ramzan Kadyrov, are best known for their participation in the invasion. However, this is an extreme case of a more general, decentralized system, where regional leaders are expected to recruit, supply, and train soldiers for battle. These are not the same types of divisions you are used to seeing in militaries. The United States Armed Forces, for example, has six branches. The Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force, the oft-forgotten Coast Guard, and the most important one, the Space Force. Ah, the Space Force. There is some overlap here. The most obvious is between the Coast Guard, and the Navy, because they both have boats. 
Meanwhile, the Navy encroaches on the Air Force's domain by having planes. The Army, Navy, Marines, and Air Force all have special forces. We could keep going on with this, but you get the idea. However, the overlaps here tend to have a clear purpose. The Navy, for example, needs aircraft to defend their carriers, and carriers make for convenient mobile bases from which to project power. The fragmentation we are talking about with Russia is different. Two entities may serve the exact same purpose, or some might just be an inferior version of another. That should sound strange. In Vladimir Putin's ideal world, Russia would have a centralized hierarchy free from overlap. Rubles spent would always go to the group with the best return on investment, and Russia would be much stronger as a consequence. Now, in practice, Every military has some weird quirks that break from this ideal. Ukraine is included in that group, with foreign legions of Georgia, Belarus, and Russia serving as prime examples. Georgia's connection is obvious given the link to the past war of 2008. Belarus and Russia are partisans against their respective regimes. They fight as unique entities because of their internal cultural connections. Russia is different because its fragmentation takes things a few steps further. So why does Russia divide its power in such a way? Like many other questions regarding this war, you will recall that today's puzzle has many answers. However, we begin with mobilization. This is definitely part of the story, but it is limited to the beginning of the war. Let's turn back our phantom hourglasses to February 2022. This was the quaint era when Russia believed that Ukraine would up and fold within a few weeks. Given that, Russia did not need to amass a giant army, just a sufficient one to do the job. Still, Putin faced two problems here. First, there were not enough contract soldiers, that is, those who voluntarily sign up in exchange for money, to do the job. Second, while there were enough conscripted soldiers, Russian law limits their deployment to domestic soil. There were three solutions to this problem. One, increase the number of contract soldiers. Two, change Russian law to allow drafted soldiers to cross the border. Or three, get creative. Option one would be expensive. And if the war was not going to last long, it would be a waste of money. Option two would shatter the narrative that this was a special military operation. That left option three, which meant recruiting outside the usual box. Historically, this is not unusual. Its spirit tracks with a bygone era in which mercenaries shored up short-term needs. For a price. Meanwhile, the soldiers of Donetsk and Luhansk were convenient supplements. They had been fighting the Shadow War since 2014 and were already in one of the key areas. However, the Oracle of Ages determined that the 2022 invasion would not be a short war. And despite that, the fractionalization continued. Thus, we must look for further explanations. Next up is casualty sensitivity. This connects to the strike against changing Russian law to allow conscripted soldiers to go on foreign deployments. The narrative of a special military operation underlies a broader domestic bargain that has kept Putin in power for more than two decades. Putin will keep the economy humming in Russia and not disrupt a citizen's day-to-day -day life. And in exchange, political opponents will stay sidelined, and Putin has free range abroad. Mass mobilization, and then the casualties that come with it, disrupt that implicit bargain. That is why the mobilization that occurred in the fall of 2022 disproportionately targeted areas outside of the Moscow and St. Petersburg power hubs. But there are limits to how far rural recruitment can go. Moreover, rural recruits from Siberia ultimately are Russian citizens. True, mass demonstrations in the capital would be worse than rebellion in the east, but the latter is still not ideal. Mercenary groups provide a workaround. Mercenary casualties are not technically under Putin's political purview. 
They are just in an economic relationship with the government and the company that oversaw their death. That's it. Or at least that's the narrative. At the end of the day, those are still Russian lives lost. And if they are coordinating with the Russian government, then politically distancing yourself from those deaths is difficult. The silver lining for Putin is that when you control the media, you control the narrative to some degree. This is helpful for maintaining a line between PMC casualties and official military casualties. But more generally, autocratic governments are not as sensitive to casualties as democratic governments are because of that media control. As such, casualty sensitivity has limited overall applicability here. And so we press on to plausible deniability. The phrase plausible deniability dates back to a National Security Council paper from the Truman administration, which detailed the United States' need for covert action in its rivalry with the Soviet Union. In other words, if anyone was caught during the activity, here's looking at you, the CIA, there needed to be some sort of firewall so that the US government could plausibly disclaim responsibility. The origins of modern PMCs as institutions trace back to this. Let's create a hypothetical one. Call it Gannon PMC. If Cannon were to be found doing something it shouldn't in, say, the Syrian civil war, well, that was Cannon that did it, not Russia. The Cannon middleman therefore insulates the Kremlin from whatever geopolitical backlash might arise. This is important if you think that war crimes are likely, either because you are ordering them for their short-term coercive benefits, or because your troops generally lack discipline and you worry that they are going to cause public relations problems no matter what you do. If that type of thing is going to be unavoidable within your military ranks, well, as an institution, you need to get creative in solving that problem. And there is a relatively clean solution here. It is better that they do these sorts of things under someone else's banner and not your own flag. This worked better at the start of the war. If the average Western or neutral party news consumer saw a headline that Canon PMC did something naughty, they might ignore it and go on with their morning hike because they have never heard of Canon PMC before. But then the Russia-Ukraine war became the single biggest news story of 2022. Once the casual news consumer hears about Canon over and over again, Eventually, they know that Russia is the one ultimately calling the shots. Plausible deniability just became implausible. And for any consumers actually in Ukraine, this does not work at all. Imagine you were a Ukrainian living in Kherson and saw a news report about a cannon massacre. To you, Russia and PMCs might as well be the same thing. With the obvious links awakening an identical anger in you, the deniability part is shot. That does not mean that plausible deniability is completely dead. Just that we might need to take a step back from our Western viewing lens. When Russia says or does something strange, it is often worth asking how someone watching this all on TV in Russia might interpret it. Remember from before that the Kremlin controls the media in Russia. No one in, say, Moscow is hearing about the dark underbelly of the war on their regular television networks. So when they happen to hear something bad about a PMC, it is easy to just dismiss the problem. Maybe the facts are wrong, or the person in question was just one bad apple. After all, your respected leadership would never tolerate that. Next up is coup proofing. This is a recurring topic on this channel, so I will keep the discussion here short. The basic idea is that autocrats have a hard time appealing to legal authority to keep themselves in power. Instead, it is a delicate balance of targeted rewards and coercion, and the coercion part is messy. If you have an external threat abroad, or you just really want to expand your borders westward, you need a strong military to assist you. The problem here is that it creates something known as a guardianship dilemma. The stronger they are abroad, 
the stronger they could be at removing you from power at home. There is a parallel possible problem after a popular uprising, even if the military itself has no direct interest in it. If the military is weak, then its fate might be tied to the survival of the current regime. Thus, in response to a massive uprising, they prefer to intervene on behalf of the autocrat. But when the military is strong, its generals know that they will remain major players in whatever new government forms. As such, the military acts as a link between worlds, allowing the protesters to succeed and then transitioning to the new regime. The central lesson for Putin is that limiting military power is important, but doing so comes at the detriment of the war effort in Ukraine. That is a dilemma. The workaround is to empower many different military organizations. This creates a balance of power. If any one decides to defect, they will soon find out that it is dangerous to go alone, as the rest of the groups crack down and send the rebel packing. Or at least they will have to figure out how to coordinate on rebellion together to avoid that outcome. The key is that it will be more difficult to do that, and that is the goal for the autocrat. Finally, we get to what I think is the most important point, internal competition for the purposes of incentivizing effort. This connects to the compliance problems endemic to the Russian military, which we've done an entire video on before. If the Russian government recognizes that its military's internal bureaucratic structure is not up to the task, then the Kremlin can delegate the problem to outside organizations instead. Essentially, Putin has created an incentive structure that economists call contests. Contests are essentially raffles. You pay for a bunch of tickets, enter them into a drawing, one of those tickets is selected, and the ticket holder ultimately wins a prize. And what a prize it is. How beautiful. The more money you spend, the more tickets you get. Obviously, the downside is that you forever lose the money that you spent, the upside is that you are more likely to win. Once you think past the pure financial framing of this incentive structure, contests appear everywhere. Sports have the same key features. The more effort you exert in practice and on the field, and the more money you spend on free agents, the more likely you are to win. And once you throw in human life as something that you can use to bid, war has the same flavor. Essentially, Russia has set up an internal subgame within the various factions. Those who produce the best results win political power and wealth at the expense of the others. To understand how this could help the Kremlin in this age of calamity, think about the strategic incentives each group has. They all have some amount of effort, lives, money, and time that they could allocate to the conflict if they so choose. Let's use eight units each as a visual representation of what they can bid. The more effort exerted, the more likely they are to win Putin's gratitude. But they forever lose the value of their effort by participating. You only keep what you don't put in. This type of problem is well studied. In a political context, usually the groups we think about are non-state affiliated militant organizations. But the logic is the same here. Each group exerts effort until the extra probability of winning Putin's prize is offset by the cost of winning. Imagine that ends up being five units each out of eight available. From Putin's perspective, having only a couple of groups is not ideal. Even with modest effort, each group still stands a good chance to win the internal power struggle. As a result, they slack off. The total effort exerted is low. This is not ideal for the Kremlin, because total effort is the thing that Putin ultimately cares about. That is what translates into a probability of winning the war against Ukraine. How might Putin solve that problem? Imagine he opens up the competition to another group. The addition makes it harder for the earlier groups to win, so they scale back their operations. However, the new group adds effort that was not present before. Given that, take a look at the collective effort. It exceeds what happened with only two groups. 
and for a government that struggles to motivate soldiers through official channels, that makes them happy. Regarding the overall outlook, that is the upshot for Russia. But it is not all roses. The organizations still need to incentivize their foot soldiers to exert effort. In that regard, fragmenting the military structure just kicks the can down the road. Leadership within the organizations also need to be confident that the Kremlin will come through with promised payments. That is questionable on a couple of fronts. First, paradoxically, if one group does too well, its leader may become a political threat. Rather than pay out the promised rewards, the Kremlin might prefer arresting everyone. In fact, by Russian law, PMCs are not allowed to exist. Thus, such a betrayal would actually be the Kremlin enforcing a rule already in the books. Second, payments require an expectation that Putin will still be around. If something surprising happens, a popular uprising on the streets of Moscow, a coup bringing in new leadership less keen on a fragmented military, or a sudden illness befalling Putin, or not so sudden if you believe the rumors, then there goes the incentive to put in the effort. The more pressing problem over the short term is the intergroup conflict that it promotes. Ostensibly, all of these groups are fighting against Ukraine. But if the success of one means that the Kremlin will deny resources to the others, then they have good reasons to go after each other. In that respect, headlines that routinely pop up about this are not surprising. Sometimes they come from Ukrainian sources, but they are plausible. There may even be issues with soldiers from one of the People's Republics refusing to go fight for the other's borders though this comes with the same caveat that it is from Ukrainian sources. But then there are also explicit demands from each group looking for more resources from the capital, and threats to abandon their posts if those demands are not met. And those are five reasons that Russia might intentionally fragment its own military. Will Russia be able to overcome the problems that fragmentation brings? Or will this war only increase the legend of Zelensky? Let me know in the comments. And hey, listen, if you want to know more about the invasion, you will love my book that investigates its many possible causes. Check below for more information on that. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you next time. Take care. A couple of months ago, I introduced you to Hashtag Where's Putin, the game where I try forcing the Russian leader to appear in odd places. He was in Kherson last time, by the way. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that it just was not fair that Putin did all of the spying. That's why I decided it was necessary to add Hashtag Where's Zelensky to this video, and indeed, the last three before it. Of course, I thought it would be funnier to do it and not tell anyone. But credit where credit is due, at least one viewer is on to me. In any case, if you have the power, wisdom, and courage to find this picture of Zelensky, hidden in some place it shouldn't be, let me know in the comments with hashtag where's Zelensky, and I will be sure to personally congratulate the first person to find him in each video. Just be forewarned that I think these are more difficult than the hashtag Where's Putin problems. Good luck. And look, I know it is a little weird to be adding these kinds of easter eggs to videos about war, especially when real people, like these guys, are risking their lives on a daily basis. Never mind the ridiculous theming I did for today's video. And yes, I spent a lot of time on this animation, and I really wanted to do it again. Also, we had another undoctored picture of Steven Seagal today. Did you catch it? But as someone who has been studying humanity doing basically the worst possible things for the better part of two decades, I think that the only way to do this over the long term and not lose one's mind is to mix in a little bit of silliness. And unfortunately, barring something bizarre happening in the Kremlin, I see this war as a long-term thing. 
None of this takes away from the fact that tens of thousands of people have lost their lives during this conflict. And it would not be surprising if ultimately hundreds of thousands of people will by the end. Nevertheless, it is important to keep up the public discourse regarding the war. For me, this is how I stay sane. And I hope it keeps you engaged and informed as well. Try to find some happiness out there. Take care.